Welcome back. Before we get into the show, remember to click that follow button on the podcast to be notified of our future fantastic guests like the author we're speaking with today. And thank you. Today's guest has worked as a newspaper editor, magazine writer, TV and radio commentator, and a reporter for the New York Times. He has received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, and National Newspaper Association. His latest book, co-written with Bob Drury, is called The Last Hill, the Epic Story of a Ranger Battalion and the Battle that Defined World War II. And author Tom Clavin joins us now. Tom, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. Good to talk to you again. Absolutely. I believe it's your third visit to the podcast. (laughs) I know. You didn't learn your lesson the first two times, huh? I know. I know. (laughs) I'll have to stop doing this. But you just put out such great books. And before we get it, you're welcome. And before we get into the book, I want to ask about the initiative that General Truscott spearheaded creating special operators based on British commandos. Uh, General Lucian Truscott was uh, one of the younger generals uh, of the early World War II generation. And I think he was less reluctant than the older ones to try something new. And for the U.S. Army, a ranger company or battalion uh, was was something new. The uh, Churchill really advocated for it uh, on the English side. And the English were very aggressively putting together these, these special units, special forces, now, we take that for granted now because of Army Rangers and Navy SEALs and some of the special forces that we have. But this was in the U.S. Army and U.S. Armed Forces in the late 30s and early 1940s. This was considered almost ungentlemanly. Finally, the the early successes of, of Churchill's uh, special forces, uh, you know, persuaded generals like Truscott uh, to to say, we need to do this also. We're going to be left behind in this war. Uh, if we if we don't have the units like this, so he advocated for it, and and fortunately he was not a voice. He ended up not being a voice crying in the wilderness because uh, General George Marshall, who had a lot to say about what went on in the U.S. Army, uh, he he took up the cause too, and he he had observers go over there and 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 participate in some of the uh, actions that were being done with the. Uh, uh, with with the British special forces and and eventually they he decided let's let's try let's give it a try and the, the very first Ranger battalion was uh, the one that's become known as Darby's Rangers. Introduce us though to uh, these Rangers, Second Battalion Rudders Rangers, who are the subject of the yeah, book. Yeah, they, they weren't Rudders Rangers right away. They were first they were they were the Second Battalion, and they were training in Tennessee. And the there was one problem after another with the commanding officers. Uh, they went through a rotation of commanding officers, uh, some because they didn't really seem to know what they were doing. They they could have been good commanding officers of a traditional unit, but a special forces unit, they didn't quite know what to do with it. And uh, But uh, uh, Colonel Rudder, uh, James Earl Rudder from uh, Eden, Texas, he had caught the eye of uh, one of the top brass. And he, th- he liked the way that Rudder was tough but fair and also a college man and 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 seemed progressive. And he said, let's let's try. I'm going to send Rudder in there. And Rudder arrived. I think it was around July 1st, 1943. And uh, right away, he, he you know gathered the men around him and, and said, I'm going to make you men. I'm going to make you soldiers. I'm going to make you rangers. And uh, that, that began a process that went on for months and months of, uh, uh, of, of, of selecting, weeding out, training. Uh, the idea was, a, you know, a typical battalion would, would not be as small as between four and 500 men. It would be battalions that are larger. But he wanted a battalion that was that was sort of more lean and mean and could move fast. And uh, what that also meant is that there weren't a lot of open spots. So if you if you didn't uh, give your all a training and excel in everything you had to excel in, you were replaced. I mean, you were sent back to your old unit or you transferred to another unit. So Rudder was a fair man, but he also had to be kind of, Maybe it's too strong a word, but kind of ruthless, too, because he had to make sure that the people in his unit that were going to end up being sent overseas were the very best that they could be. And they obviously engaged in battles in Europe. Uh, One of those was the Hurtgen Forest battle. Before we get into their actions in the battle, tell us a little bit about that battle and um, any actions they had before that battle. The Hurtgen Forest is a reason why the book exists the last hill because uh my co-author bob drury uh while we were finishing up our previous book had lunch with a retired army colonel and the subject of the hurt and forest came up now 
Bob, like many people, may have heard of the Hurricane Forest campaign, but didn't really know anything about it. You know, it's not like D-Day. It's not like the Bud of the Bulge. It's not like the one of the Pacific campaigns, with like not like Anzio or anything like that. And one reason for that is that the Hurricane Forest was a, uh, a, a, a really a, a blood-soaked ground. It was a campaign that dragged on for months and months and months in the fall of 1944. Advances very slow by the Allies against Germany and mistakes were made uh, about how the how the campaign was conducted. And so Bob got really keen on doing a book on the Hurricane Forest, but I was not keen on doing a book on the Hurricane Forest as, a, as an entire campaign. I said, let's can we find a story that is within the Hurricane Forest campaign? We can tell there is the overall story we could tell, but let's focus on one particular uh, uh, story that we can relate. And uh, that's when we came across the Second Ranger Battalion. And I should mention the Second Ranger Battalion had received some attention before, uh, not only during the war, but in, uh, subsequently. Uh, there's a, there's a book uh, by Doug Brinkley that was done. By, involving the 2nd Ranger Battalion, but it always centered on D-Day because on D-Day, mm -hmm. the 2nd Ranger Battalion was tasked with, with disabling the guns at Point du Hoc uh, on uh, Normandy Beach. And it's like when that day was over, so was the story of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. And as we did some more research, we realized that the untold story is that what happened after that. Uh, one of the, the breast campaign, for example, was very important part of, of, of the uh, taking over, taking occupied France back, but especially what we call Hill 400 and uh, Castle Hill, it's sometimes referred to. And uh, that was really the first hill inside Germany that the allies needed to take for a number of reasons. And so as we did more research on that and found out how important and how desperate that battle was you really had the elite of the allied forces and the, and the rangers facing the elite of the german forces we said that's our story you know we could tell a hurricane forest story as backdrop but we really want to focus on on the second ranger battalion and and the, and the officers and the enlisted men that made up that cut that battalion i hope you're enjoying this episode next time middle east diplomat and author ethan choran joins us to discuss his new book benghazi a new history of the fiasco that pushed america in its world to the brink. You know, Benghazi presents a paradox. There was four years of partisan warfare over this event. And yet, with all the noise, and, and I argue because of the noise, we never really got down, got into the, to the details of who was behind this, what really unequivocally happened there? Where did it come from? As in, it didn't just come out of nowhere. There were antecedents, and I linked those antecedents both to 9-11 and to the rapprochement with Gaddafi. Another reason to click that follow button to be notified when the episode releases. And before we return to the conversation, if you're enjoying the story of Special Forces in World War II, check out our earlier program, Marine Raiders, the true story of the legendary World War II battalions, with author Carol Engel Averett. The World War II Raiders are just a remarkable group of special forces that were trained to go in and to do uh, really, you know, your show is called the point of the spear, the tip of the spear, and that's right. really what they were. They would go in and do raids, quick, fast traveling, very quickly. They were tremendous hand-to-hand -hand combat warriors. They uh, used their knives, stilettos, and had a lot of very special things, that, tactics that they used during the war. It's show 143 